Hey this is Sayyam Botani and you're listening to Chai Time Data Science a podcast for data science enthusiasts where i interview practitioners researchers and calculators about their journey experience and talk all things about data science and welcome to another episode of the chai time data science show in this episode i interview three great amazing contributors to pytorch and also the authors of an upcoming book titled uh, deep learning with pytorch by manning publications eli stevens luca antiga and thomas in this interview we talk about their journey into machine learning and their journey with pytorch their efforts into writing the book for the audience that might be curious what does writing a book as as an experience look like we also discuss about that the authors also share what can one expect from the book what are you expected uh, to have prepared before learning from the book and what can you take away from it there is also a lot of great advice around project building which is i believe one of the essence to getting your break into the field so please stay tuned for that thanks to manning publications i am also doing a giveaway for of the book i've already given away one copy for the ama four more copies will be given away along with this episode to participate the details are there in the description but just share your favorite quote from any interview on the series this one or otherwise and i'll get in touch uh, with the four selected winners Manning Publications has also been very kind to offer a 40% discount on all of their products Please use the coupon code POD CHAI20 P O D C H A I 20 to use this discount coupon. Thanks to Manning for doing the giveaway and for the discounts. For now, here's the interview. Please enjoy the show. everyone i'm really excited to be talking to three amazing people thomas lucas and eddie on the show uh, if you could please introduce yourselves by your ways because some of the audience will be tuning in from the audio sure i'll go ahead and start uh my name's eli stevens i'm uh currently a machine learning infrastructure engineer at zoox and uh one of the three authors on deep learning with pytorch and i'm luca antiga i am a co-founder of a couple of companies one is orobix it's based in italy the other one is called tensorwork and it spun off from orobix last year um orobix is doing ai engineering and service and tensorwork is doing uh, tool development so this is what i'm into the most lately i'm a bi engineer by by background Yeah, so I'm uh, Tom. I uh, I'm a mathematician by background and uh, I kind of started uh, uh, a PyTorch and machine learning consulting company in 2018. Um and uh yeah, when I chatted with uh and I think Piotr uh, uh Bialecki who you probably know from PyTorch uh yeah he and i joked about an imaginary book and then eli connected me to a real book so that's why i'm here to awesome so uh, thanks I for want... having us Re- really excited to be talking to all of you so uh, before i talk about what you're working in your day to day i want to start about uh, how did you get interested in machine learning deep learning broadly speaking uh, eli maybe if you want to share your story where did you finally find your passion and of uh, your passionate enough to switch into a career in machine learning yeah so i i'd always been interested in artificial intelligence ever since uh, college i wanted to do uh, ai for video games um but uh 
I graduated just after the first internet bubble had burst. And so I was like, get a job, any job. Um, and so all of those, all of those things kind of fa- fell by the wayside. Um, and uh, it wasn't until uh, 2017, early 2017, there was a, um, a Kaggle competition. The data science bowl was having their lung cancer detection challenge. Um, and that was finally the thing that, that was like, okay, I need to get back into that million dollar prize pool. I knew I wasn't going to win anything, but <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this, this is finally the time. Okay. Um, and I don't know if this was a coincidence or not, but PyTorch 0.1 had released at basically the exact same time. And so the two just dovetailed really nicely. I dove into PyTorch and um, I was like, okay, I need to go ahead and set up a, a career pivot into this, uh, which is part of the reason why I accepted uh, when Manning approached me and said, hey, do you want to write a book? So th- that would have been one of the first uh, PyTorch uh, approaches on Kaggle, I believe, if, if we were to date it. Possibly. Um, like I said, I, I did not do particularly well because I was learning PyTorch and learning deep learning all at the same time. And that's not a recipe for hitting the top of the Kaggle leaderboards. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was a great learning experience. And uh, uh, I think that the couple of bug fixes and documentation updates that I submitted back to the PyTorch project super early is what got me on uh, Manning Publications radar. So. Okay. And uh, Luca, I believe uh, you've been involved in the medical space for over 20 years. Uh, when did you find your interest for machine learning? Yeah, so uh, pretty late, <laughs> I would say. Uh, I'm a bioengineer and um, I've been doing research in the 2000s, uh, mostly on cardiovascular mechanics and medical image processing. And back then we were doing a lot of, you know, that your background, you knew bunch of algorithms and you had to come up with a, uh, the right cocktail of stuff that would make things happen. And the way we got into machine learning was uh, uh, with aerobics, I, we, we got a, a, uh, an important gig with a pharma company. And we got this 4,000 scans. It was back in 2014, I think. And after eight months, we couldn't, you know, <laughs> we, 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 we couldn't say we, we had solved the problem. And, and and we say okay, let's try. You know, we, we uh, there were a few papers, uh, not not very many papers on deep learning in uh, on medical imaging, and we say, well, yeah, let's try with that. And we went to the Torch Seven, and after a few months, we we had we had a solution to the problem. So we kind of understood at that point that the world was going to change, and so we said, okay, let's verticalize the company on these technologies and open up from medical to manufacturing to gaming. We, last year, there was a game that we contributed to MotoGP19 uh, with reinforcement learning. And, um, and so that's how I got into that. And that's how I got into Torch because it had uh, good 3D convolutions for 3D like volumes. Uh, and it was uh, simple. So you, you could read the high levels down to the kernels. And I liked that fact. And, and then that's what got me into PyTorch. And then I got in touch with the community and started contributing. So it's been a, a really great experience. Awesome. Are you talking about Torch or PyTorch? Because uh, some of the millennial yeah. <laughs> audience might yeah, know yeah. the difference. Well, back, back then, you know, in 2015 or so, uh, if you want to Torch, you got Torch 7, which was based on Lua. Uh, and had a C uh, backend with uh, C and CUDA. Uh, so the the really nice thing about Tor about Torch Seven is that you could really understand everything. You could start from the top and go down to the bottom, and it was very readable. Uh, it was uh, uh, let's say particular in the way it was built. Very 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 smart. Uh, and in fact, the uh, PyTorch One Point Zero uh, Zero Point One. Sorry was uh, a Python layer on top of the same backend. So that's why I, I got excited. And then um, it was amazing to me to see that PyTorch uh, had basically the same API very early on uh, with a very few breaking changes, very, very few breaking changes. 
but everything underneath transformed over the course of uh, two or three years. And it was great to you know, be involved at, at, at that early stage. Awesome. So bo both of you are early adopters of Torch and PyTorch. Uh, Thomas is one of the core developers behind PyTorch. Uh, Thomas, when did you find your interest for machine learning? So uh, in a way, I've been a data guy very early on. Uh, I remember that when I was like six or seven, uh, I wrote a little program to plot bar charts of, uh, I think it was some <laughs> juvenile delinquency statistics that uh, uh, my father was uh, uh, working on or working with. And so uh, uh, that was the very first computer program I saved to a floppy disk. Uh, I remember because I wrote the program, we went and bought the floppy disk, and then I saved it. <laughs> but, uh, but so I have this fascination for data uh, uh, and probably for science. Um, I even took, uh, 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 when I went to university, I took a class called Neural Networks and Pattern Recognition. There was the 2000 style <laughs> variant of that. Um, but then I kind of went into pencil and paper mathematics, mainly for social reasons, uh, uh, because uh, I kind of I met a great crowd of mathematicians. Uh, uh, and then I went to become an actuary. So I helped insurance companies with statistics and uh, mathematical modeling and then at some point, and I've always been kind of a computer person. Uh, I used to be a Deb Debian developer back then. Uh, and so at some point, I went back to uh, uh, doing machine learning things. Um, and at that time, it was Tiano and, uh, uh, and TensorFlow, early TensorFlow. Um, and then when PyTorch, the first public release of PyTorch came out, it immediately uh, fascinated me that it was so easy to use and, uh, and very Pythonic in a way. I've been programming Python for, I don't know, 25 years or so. Um, so that really made me feel at home. And then uh, I started contributing a few patches. And then there was a, a GTC in Munich and uh, Sumerth and Adam and a bunch of uh, uh, the other uh, Facebook people uh, came to Munich and I wrote to Sumerth, hey, want to go for a beer? And so uh, I always say I came for the, for PyTorch, the <laughs> library, but I stayed for the company uh, oh, yeah. uh, that I found uh, uh, with the other developers. And uh, uh, really I've been very good friends uh, with Piotr um, and uh, I met him uh, in real life for a couple of uh, times because he was also based in Munich originally, uh, also based in Germany, it's not that far from Munich. Um, yeah, and so this is what got me into PyTorch. And so at some point, uh, uh, Piotr told me, hey, yeah, you're showing up on the persons of interest page of PyTorch. <laughs> That's, uh, kind of the story behind that. And that's never a, that's was a connected plan. story. Yeah, there's a connected story to this. I'd never realized when you met Sumit and Adam, uh, the day before or two days before uh, GTC that year, I believe, um, they I hijacked their, uh, their trip to hold, the, I think, the first workshop, uh, public workshop on PyTorch in, uh, in Milan. So I, uh, we were connected somehow and uh, they say, yeah, sure, we're coming to G GTC. So uh, I also <laughs> met Adam for the first time there. <laughs> so in a short time span, then they met you. That's interesting. Awesome. Thomas, did you find your math background to be your secret weapon? Many people assume you need to do so with math when you're jumping into machine learning. Did you find that super helpful? Well, so it certainly shapes uh, how I think about these things. And also kind of sometimes it makes me demand very hard things from my co-authors in terms of giving numbers and graphs and also how, how to present things graphically. 
Um, I find myself having lots of opinions there. Um, I would certainly say that a mathematical intuition of some sort helps. Um, you certainly don't need a PhD in maths to be successful in machine learning, right? Um, but so I guess not being scared of maths certainly helps and it shapes my view of things. Uh, of course, I have to learn a lot of uh, uh, the engineering things as I go along that come more natural to you guys, right? Awesome. So now I want to uh, fast forward to today. If you could share what you're working on today, uh, the task you're tackling, all of you, and are you using PyTorch at work in production today? Uh, I'll go ahead and start on this one because I, I think I've got the least interesting answer. Um, like I said, I'm working at uh, uh, Zooks, for, uh, which is in the autonomous mobility space, self-driving cars. Um, I'm doing uh, machine learning infrastructure work there. Uh, but I've been told by the legal department I can't talk about what I do much beyond that. <laughs> okay. So they're they're very concerned with IP protection, and so I'm trying to respect their wishes there. Got it. Zooks was one of the first, I believe, to get uh, permission uh, in California to support transport of, I think, uh, people of the public. But uh, I'll, I'll have the website linked in the description for what we can view publicly. Sounds good. Uh, Lucas, do you want to share your uh, current day to day? What, yeah, what does it do? So, uh, yeah, so Aerobics, uh, at Aerobics, we're about 30 people now, and we do projects on different, in, in different fields. And everything we do is basically in PyTorch. So, Py, PyTorch is very pervasive to what we do. It's actually the only deep learning framework we use. And I would say we, we, in the data science uh, floor, we do primarily deep learning. So yeah, uh, we're, we're, we follow along very much. And then uh, with TensorWork on the other end, uh, we do infrastructure uh, tools. And so uh, again, uh, PyTorch comes up, uh, you know, uh, very prominently there. So yeah, uh, I'm happy to, to I'm, uh, I'm fortunate to be able to include that in my day-to-day -day work. Awesome. Yes, yeah, so uh, I'm doing lots of fighter things. Uh, I'm also doing a few things that are kind of below the PyTorch uh, 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 layer, if you want. So uh, working relatively close to the hardwood, developing new kernels or things that can produce new kernels. Um, but I certainly do a lot of work uh, with PyTorch too uh, for various clients. Uh, so I've also worked with uh, Aerobics and uh, had the honor and pleasure to meet uh, uh, many of Lucas' colleagues uh, there and they're a great team to work with. Um, and, uh, and then I used to do and used to like to do uh, uh, in-person workshops too, uh, using PyTorch. So for example, PyTorch on the Raspberry, uh, things like that. But unfortunately, in-person training isn't that, that good a deal right now, but yeah. I think many people miss out on the fact that uh, core developers go through the pain of writing the kernel so that we don't need to know what's happening under the hood. <laughs> and that's thanks to the amazing books, the resources that we have out there. Coming to the book that all three of you are working on, Deep Learning with PyTorch by Manning Publications, what made you decide to start writing it? I, I think the community resources were great in PyTorch already. Why did you decide to start writing it? I guess we can just keep the same order on this. Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, I was approached by Manning asking if I'd be interested in writing the book. and um, at the time, I was a little bit hesitant. Uh, I was uh, working at a startup that we were in the process of trying to sell. I had two young kids at home. I was like, I do not have time for this. And uh, and I said, yeah, yeah, we hear you. We hear you. Uh, how, how about a co-author? Do you think that would help? And <laughs> uh, 
so they introduced me to Luca and uh, we talked and the, the way I like to put it is Luca and I put our heads together and discussed it a little bit and decided that, that, you know, two times zero was enough time to write a book. And so <laughs> um, for, for me, the big motivation um, was wanting to facilitate a career pivot. Um, my career prior had had a lot of Python experience, but nothing on the deep learning side. Um, and like I said, I had wanted to, to be into that field for a long time. And I was like, okay, this is my chance to go ahead and do something that will get me into those job interviews that, you know, I probably would just be passed over. Cause like, well, why is this guy applying for this job? He doesn't have any experience. Um, <laughs> so that was a big part of my motivation is, is to go ahead and, and, you know, use it as a way of communicating my seriousness about wanting that, wanting that career pivot. Yeah, I I also told Manning I wouldn't I didn't have time and uh, yeah that that was the, <laughs> there was there must be some game theory behind this anyway um, uh, at the time I was uh, like I, I've been contributing to PyTorch for a couple of years or one year and a half uh, and then life happened and uh, and PyTorch took really took off so I decided to to slow that down. Um, and but at the time i would say i was very involved and, and so i really wanted to understand how things worked and i think there's a it's a good chance you know to have having to explain things to others uh it's a it's a good opportunity to to, to learn them yourself and so that's why i kind of decided or let life uh take its course on this <laughs> i i didn't i i wouldn't i didn't realize it would be an endeavor that would, you know, accompany me for quite some time. And, uh, but uh, I think it was a really good decision. Uh, Thomas, uh, do, do you want to say your story? Huh. Yeah. And so at, uh, uh, at the, about the same time, I think when the uh, uh, public excerpts uh, uh, of the book uh, uh, were finalized, uh, Luca and Eli uh, uh, kind of wanted a secret weapon, I guess, and yeah. uh, and so uh, uh, when uh, uh, when Piotr and I joked on the on the PyTorch uh, Slack channel about our imaginary book, uh, Eli said, "Well, yeah, does one of you want to write or help us uh, uh, out with the with the real book instead of just an imaginary one?" Uh, uh, and yeah, I was the first to show my hand and obviously with uh, being part of my own company, I don't have a legal department to, to keep me from doing it. And so, uh, uh, I mean, if you looked at the, at the uh, uh, public book, uh, it's a really, I really like the, the parts that they already had. And so uh, uh, I decided to help uh, with the with the final chapter uh, uh, and uh, and uh, bits of the bits of the first part that they were covering new PyTorch and things like that. And yeah, so uh, I always wanted to write a book, and now this was a chance that I can pass on. And uh, uh, at the same time, uh, uh, it was a good opportunity to also have uh, good contact with the with Eli and uh, Luca because he's also in Europe in particular. And uh, that was great, a great thing and is a great thing. Yeah, and if I can expand on that a little bit, I, I think that, that Thomas is kind of underselling how much he helped get the book over the finish <laughs> line. Um, yeah. it, had, it had been, I think when we contacted him, a little over two years that Luke and I had been working on the book and we'd made a lot of great progress, but it, it, it Thomas just really brought like an attention to detail and, and was able to do like, you know, just a, a fr fresh set of eyes pass over the book while at the same time actually helping rather than just, well, you should make this more clear. You should make this more clear. He was actually able to make it more clear, which was <laughs> really key in terms of actually us, us, all three of us being able to wrap up the project. So it was, it was really good that he came on when he did. Awesome. 
Th- thank you for creating the book. Uh, I, I would have mentioned this in the in- intro that I record separately. I'm doing a giveaway and the book is already live. But uh, for the people, uh, w- what can we expect from the book who would like to check it out? Uh, what kind of audience are you expecting? And if you could expand on the structure of the book, uh, what will the audience who reads it take away from the book? Uh, we, we can follow the same order or uh, as you see fit. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I, I can jump in on that. Um, we we wanted to aim the book at uh, software engineers who are comfortable using Python. So, you know, we expect you to know classes and loops and, and all of that kind of stuff. We're not going to cover any of that. Um, we expect that the readers will have an interest in deep learning. So, you know, hopefully, you know, real, real simple exposure to some of the basic concepts. We explain all of that stuff, but it, it always helps if you kind of have an idea of what it is you're about to learn before you learn it. Um, and we broke the book into three parts. The first part is uh, talking about the API of PyTorch, talking about how its basic data structures are set up, how they interact, what you can use them for, and going through uh, basically building that intuitive sense of what it's going on under the hood when you do deep learning. How does back propagation work? How do you compute a gradient? And then building that up to the, by the end of um, uh, part one, you've done basic uh, image recognition using convolutional neural networks. Um, Then for, we kind of switch in part two, Part two is um, we take a single project, and it's actually the the same uh, data science bowl lung cancer detection project that we mentioned earlier. Uh, we take that project and and work through that over the course of several chapters, and it's a lot of let's get the most basic thing that could possibly work implemented, see what it takes in order to do that, and then investigate problems with it. Why isn't it working? How can we make it work better? And then the next chapter will go say, okay, we found this problem last chapter. Let's figure out what we need to do to fix it. How do we improve our metrics? How do we improve our logging? How do we you know, improve the actual results that we're getting? And then we take that through then to actually being able to do um, uh, consume a CT scan and detect, detect lung cancer on it. Um, obviously the results aren't clinical and we, we mentioned, we can talk about that in the book, but you know, you're still able to see a, a larger scope project end to end. Uh, then in part three, we talk about, um, the, uh, the production aspects of how do you then take this and actually get it into your user's hands. Um, part three is a single chapter. Uh, and so it's, it's a little bit shorter and unfortunately it's one of the parts that's, uh, that's changing the most rapidly. Um, and so, you know, there's been some recent announcements of Torch Serving and Torch Elastic that unfortunately aren't going to make it into the book. We had one of the readers on the forums ask about that today. And I was like, ah, sorry. It's, <laughs> the text is done. It's out of our hands. Uh, Luca, Tom, do you guys want to add anything to, to my ramble there? Yeah, well, the plan for the book, if you remember, Eli. Oh, boy. <laughs> was a bit oh, different. Boy. <laughs> so first message, if you want to write the book, you know, do a very good first plan and just be aware that that is not going to (laughs) happen because in the end. (laughs) Yeah. uh, The part one is the one I I was definitely more involved in. Like I I uh, I spent many hours in that. And um, and when you set, like when you focus on a, on a possible reader and then you say, I, I'll explain this and that, and then we'll work through this. And, and then you start really writing it. You find yourself in the middle of it. And you know one of the scenes in the uh, hotel hall where the, the, the corridors become longer, you know, it just, it, it, was it, what is it called, dolly zoom, something like that? Uh, that's the feeling, you know, when, when you start writing, then the road ahead of you becomes longer as you write (laughs) it becomes even longer (laughs) because you realize that really to uh to to approach a subject like that uh, and if you don't really want to you know pretend you explain something but you actually want to build some kind of intuition behind it uh, the person that doesn't have that background 
then you really have to take a few steps and maybe renounce some um, uh, some, some some formal introduction of concepts and maybe focus them a bit more on building the, the intuition that will serve you to then get those concepts up. And so I think the scope has been uh, to, from, from very early on to write a book that could take uh, a developer or an engineer or an interested person in any case, even social science with some programming background uh, uh, to the point they could consume the online blogs, the excellent documentation online, you know, to that stage. Uh, so uh, there, there were really few resources that could connect you from, uh, from basics to that point. And so we tried to create a book that addresses that. Yeah, I think I uh, kind of to echo what Eli and uh, Lucas said. Uh, so the first part, and that's uh, essentially most of it is publicly or available for free uh, uh, from the PyTorch uh, uh, website. Um, and uh, uh, the focus there, and really the, the thing we've tried very hard to do is to uh, uh, kind of deliver an in-depth intuition and find intuitions uh, that kind of uh, can, can take you very far uh, without kind of slapping formulas at, at people because I'm a mathematician. I can be very, <laughs> I can read a lot of formulas, but I also learn hard uh, uh, that uh, if you go light on formulas, you'll have a much, much more agreeable day uh, uh, on many days, right? Um, and so we, tr we really try to, to make this about intuitions that are worth the first part. And at the same time, you have you have the PyTorch code, and you have little bits of PyTorch code throughout the throughout the chapters to follow along purely in code, right? Um, and then the second part really is about the journey uh, uh, that a typical data science project would take, or a typical deep learning uh, project would take. And so, uh, uh, and I think that's kind of, and probably Luca and Eli will. <laughs> will uh, uh, agree kind of the the techniques the pytorch neural network architecture building blocks uh, uh, they're just a tiny part of any real deep learning project and so uh, uh, in part two we emphatically don't uh, uh, show yeah here you use this network on this data set and then you get whatever results but we want to take you on a more where the data is like data in the real world is, and you have to uh, uh, kind of uh, at every point uh, you have to ask yourself, well, what can I do with the data? Where do I have to watch out? And what can I do if the standard methods, kind of the tutorial methods that you might apply, for example, to classification when this doesn't work out, well, what are we going to do next? And so it's really kind of this realistic journey that's our focus and that's maybe also a bit different to books that kind of show you, yeah, you can do this and this and this with PyTorch and can this and this and this network. Uh, uh, we really have uh, uh, kind of convolutional networks and also units uh, uh, that go coarse and then fine. And those are very simple and kind of well-seasoned architectures by now, but really you, to have an end-to-end -end project to follow, so maybe something that gives you some orientation when you're at the same, some intuition when you're at the same place in your own project, I think that's uh, you know, the key thing that we wanted to convey in that part two. And that's really, I think also the, the test of the books for you is if you, want to see something like this end to end and learn by doing it rather than learn by having it explained to you. Awesome. I, I think many people miss out on that. Some books uh, don't uh, survive the time, the test of time, so to speak, and the specific on architectures that will inevitably, inevitably get outdated in a year. It's, it's machine learning we're talking about. 
if you could talk about uh, give us a behind the scenes overview of how does the writing process look like many people are used to writing blog posts they think hey maybe i can just compile a series of blog posts think along those lines and that becomes a book is is that the case or if you could talk about your uh, process of writing the book so i've not been there but i'd say writing a book is pretty much a top down process so you start out with a table of contents and then uh, uh, you drill down and now Luca and Eli will tell me that it's not the whole weeks. So I think Luca hinted at this early on. When we, when we set out to write the book, we actually had an idea of um, taking interesting papers of the day, implementing them in PyTorch, explaining them, and and like having a, a paper per chapter. And then we realized like that that each chapter was going to be a book all by itself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or, or rather, I think our, our publisher realized that and told us, no, <laughs> no, don't do that. Um, okay. But uh, uh, we, we definitely, like Tom said, we had our, our table of contents. We outlined what we want to do. And, you know, no, no good plan survives contact with the enemy. And the enemy here is time. Okay. Um, and so uh, the the... The, the nature of what it is that we were trying to do in the grand sense uh, was pretty consistent. And like the, the individual chapters that we were writing were pretty consistent, but like that, that kind of middle, like, okay, what, what should part three be? Is there going to be a part four? Like a lot of that ended up changing as, as the project developed. Um, I had a very strong feeling of wanting to provide the book that I wish I'd had six months earlier. Um, and so that's why I was, I was really insistent that, that we use the, the, the length of a book to be able to do something more in depth. And so I was, I was really pushing for that part two single project. Let's like actually do it. And that's the kind of thing that, that I think that you, you, might be able to pull off as a series of blog posts. But one of the things that I found is that as I was writing, you know, chapter 13, I was having to go back to chapter 11 and make sure that the, the chapter 11 set up things in a way that, you know, the features we were adding in chapter 13 slotted in cleanly. And so like, when you look at the, you know, the chapter 11 code, you're like, oh yeah, okay. This seems like reasonable code. But there was, and I'm not trying to, you know, toot my own horn on this, but it felt like there was a lot of a lot of careful craft that had to go into getting code that seemed reasonable for chapter 11, and also still seemed reasonable for chapter 13. Because by the time chapter 13 rolled around, it's like, oh, the god, this is I'm not, not going to be able to fit this in here. I have to refactor all of this. <laughs> and yet that refactor then needs to get backported several chapters and still look okay when you remove the reason for the refactor. And so at least for for my experience, which I realize is, is not not even the whole of this book, much less every book out there, I think that the amount of interconnectedness and planning that that particular let's walk through a large project requires um, made it, it, it would be difficult to do it as a series of blog posts, I think, because you'd have to write all the blog posts and then be done with them and then just dole them out, you know, one a week once you were already yeah. finished with the whole thing, which at that point, just write a book and get a publisher, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, I, I think we should also mention that uh, the team at Manning, they've been uh, doing a really great job, not only in the planning aspects that we already touched, but also in telling us where we were tutors or where we uh, uh, did things in a not ideal way and remind us uh, uh, that, well, we have to uh, tell the reader and we have to show the code for everything and explain like how everything works and not gloss over the things we thought were maybe not that interesting to us, but a reader probably would want to have been told about. And so, uh, uh, at least for me personally, I exchanged the most mails with Francis, Brian, and Tiffany, and they really 
made it a much better book than three of us could write on our own. And so uh, uh, having this professional team in there certainly uh, uh, is an important part, not only for finishing the book actually, but also for uh, for uh, the quality of of what uh, the reader gets. Yeah. I, I yeah. No, I, I was saying my experience, uh, as I said, I, I work uh, mostly on part one. And my my experience has been a bit different because part one is easier, like from, from the structure standpoint, it's more sequential. So it was less of a challenge and it's organized in chapters that are uh, almost self-contained. You just have, you just need to realize that uh, what, what you explained and not uh, take any, anything from granted. Uh, what I bring home from, from this experience is that I, I really cherish the moments, the, the nights that I sat there and just let it out. <laughs> so in total, the, the writing process didn't take that long. Like it was very concentrated in time. Uh, it was in, done in really in sprints with uh, individual chapters that would go just bloom. And, and I didn't really know how a chapter would evolve. <laughs> and the, uh, it, it just came that way. And uh, it was really nice, almost narrative to, to follow the lead. And at, at, the, at the end of the session, you had something that didn't ex exist before. So it made me discover this long form, you know, after writing several papers or, you know, scientifically and so on. It, writing scientific papers is a game of Tetris that it's really hard to win, like a super master level. You have every sentence has to be functional to something and necessary and sufficient to explain something. But having the luxury of uh, writing a whole chapter and, you know, uh, and creating it in a way that wouldn't be the same if you wrote it the next day, it was very fascinating. So uh, the, there is this aspect to me that, that it's important and I, I hope I'll do it again uh, in due time. But, <laughs> but I hope to find myself in that position. I don't know technical books or whatever, I don't know. But it, it's a nice feeling. I, I hope so too. I, I guess it's it's like you mentioned, uh, it's like the process of going through the tunnel and uh, not having to see the end. Uh, you're going through the process. Many people miss out on the fact that blogs are okay, casually written. Uh, I, I guess I started off with a bad example in comparison, but still. And books take a lot of professional work for the same reason that someone picks them up for their professional journey. They, they trust the authors, they trust the book to take away something. Uh, for for those people, uh, what do you suggest way to go from the book once they've made it through the book? Uh, for someone seeking a career in deep learning or just like hoping to get ahead in their path in deep learning, where do you suggest going from the book? No, I've never written a blog post actually. I, I think yeah, I am uh, very shy about that. <laughs> I don't okay. know how I, <laughs> but I can I can share the blame with these two for the book. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I I think that. Uh, my take on on how someone would go from from zero to career, I think that I think that one of the big challenges is uh, is going to be just just the the process of interviewing, because there's for better or worse, a lot of times when a job is posted on the internet there will be a flood of people applying to it, uh, especially at least the tech industry specifically. You know, and I'm, I'm coming at this from a San Francisco Bay Area perspective, so I don't know about how the rest of things work, work elsewhere, but you're gonna get a flood of applications from a bunch of people who haven't read any of the requirements, don't meet any of the requirements, and just just click the button and on Craigslist or LinkedIn or, or, or wherever. And so one of the challenges then for someone who's trying to break in is to catch the eye of that hiring manager of that recruiter and say, Hey, I'm someone who, even though I may not have, you know, 10 years of experience doing deep learning, which, you know, given the state of the world is incredibly difficult to have right now. Like you need to be able to catch their eye in some way to say, okay, this isn't, this is one of the ones I just need to throw this resume in the trash because they didn't read anything. Um, you can't do that with a cover letter because half the time the cover letters just get 
thrown in the trash too. And so my suggestion would be to go ahead, work on a project. You know, the, the, the book hopefully equips readers to be able to do that kind of thing. So go ahead and do it. Pick something that you think is interesting. Maybe it's a Kaggle project. Maybe it's something that, you know, that you've wanted to try. You know, it, it doesn't have to be this, this grand thing. Uh, just something, something that you've done, try and get some results with it, get it up on GitHub and, and have a section on your resume that lists out, you know, uh, probably file it as open source rather than hobbyist, but like open source contributions, you know, lead developer on this project and talk, you know, have a couple bullet points about the, the results that you achieved. And it's like that I, I would hope at least for some people is going to be enough to say, oh, well, maybe I should take a deeper look at this person and see what they're about. Um, that's my hope. Uh, we'll see what happens when the book's actually out there. And um, we have gotten some feedback from a, from a couple early readers that, that indicated that those kinds of things were possible. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping I'm not too far off base there. Uh, I don't know, Tom, anything you've got to, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, I think writing a book probably isn't the best path. <laughs> it's not. But, it's really uh, not. Uh, and not the fastest either, I should say, <laughs> at least for you guys. Um, but uh, so more seriously, I think that if you if you contribute to op open source projects uh, uh, on GitHub uh, and you and you manage to find a project where you can have meaningful contributions and it's a reasonably popular project, then you'll uh, eventually get mail from recru recruiters too. Um, so I can track that because I use a distinct email for GitHub. Um, and so uh, uh, quite a few larger companies uh, uh, contacted me because of that. Um, when before people, I, I once applied for a, for a uh, data science position before uh, uh, doing my own thing. And they rejected me because I didn't have any practical credentials. Um, <laughs> and so, I mean, this is basically do something, um, either contribute to, to uh, uh, an existing project that people will look at, uh, uh, well, who's doing that and who might be available from that. Um, and the larger companies actually seem to do that. Um, and the other thing is, uh, 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 I guess, just do other fun things like a tutorial blog post can be, can be pretty good too. Um, and also a project. Uh, and if you do a project, don't do the, in, and this is something where I'm hesitant to uh, uh, wholeheartedly recommend Kaggle. If you have your own project idea, like a creative application of, of classification, right? Classification isn't all that hard, uh, or at least the core of it isn't all that hard in deep learning to do with deep learning. Uh, but if you have a really good idea what to what to apply it to, I think that makes a great project because uh, you can then really show, and maybe you can even, uh, 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 if you if you have the chance, you could even include a picture in your application uh, of your of the output of your project. So uh, I think that's a uh, really creating a project that you can work with is one way, one great way. The other would be kind of contribute meaningfully to a relatively high profile project. Uh, in the area where you want to work in. Yeah, I totally agree. If I can add something to that, um, I need one of, I think one of the things that, um, uh, one of the dangers is to uh, to do uh, small picks of one thing and the other thing, which is fine for a certain stretch of time. Uh, but then uh, you run the risk of n not building stuff. So not putting, this tiny bits on top of each other and actually see something uh, grow from that, you know, be either contributions or your own project. So what I can recommend is persistence. So keep at it and, and you'll get 
better and better. Um, and, and so if, and if possible, you, you should pick something that you will live with for, for a while, that, that you're okay living with for a while. Um, because um, I think reaching some level of polish or some presence or you know, accruing experience takes time. So even in this fast changing world. So. For sure. Um, it's, it's, I, I like to call it the curse of infinite learning. We just keep going from one uh, resource to another because just because they market it so well and you keep feeling intimidated. Hey, I don't know what this is. Let me just try that another book, try another course. Maybe after that, I'll know how to get in the top 10% of Kaggle. But it's, it's about being in the right uh, discomfort zone where you can just keep learning and building a skill. Uh, if you could recommend, for example, someone who might want to contribute to PyTorch, for example, uh, where would you recommend them to start? After reading the book, of course, uh, for example. <laughs> Probably one of the ways is finding something that where you think something is wrong in PyTorch and then go uh, uh, find a way to fix it. Um, and uh, uh, obviously, uh, if, if you do your part of the research, my experience with the, with the PyTorch people uh, uh, is that they'll be very happy to help you along to kind of go from, you've done the research, you've developed a rough idea how to, how to fix things uh, to uh, uh, you actually submit that uh, pull request. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, I think trying to fix something small uh, uh, or at least kind of well scoped. So for example, if you find, yeah, here, for example, uh, uh, there's uh, something slow about, uh, about uh, some particular kernel uh, the other day, someone someone fixed the unfold kernel backward, uh, uh, and so there there was something funny going on in the PyTorch kernel, and most of the PyTorch kernels are very very good, um, but there's always things that you can improve also with specific functions, and if you find something like that, that's probably a fairly good project. To, or a fairly good first thing to work on, but again, if you if you feel like like uh, uh, doing your own uh, project, I think that might be even a superior approach. Uh, uh, and for that, I would strictly recommend to go from you have a problem you want to tackle, and then you solve that, and the PyTorch is there to help you go from problem to solution. PyTorch is not an end in itself uh, uh, for most parts. I mean, improving PyTorch in order to facilitate more great projects is a good goal too, but you always want to have something that's kind of a problem you want to solve and then you want to work to, on it and uh, the things you learn in between should be kind of getting you ahead with the problem rather than just trying to know everything about everything. Yeah, I guess that's, maybe. Oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I, I guess yeah. that's that's a great point. Uh, like you mentioned, uh, someone might feel I have no idea what a kernel is, what a backport is. But if it's curiosity driven, you might, uh, with a fresh set of eyes, realize, hey, something funny is going on, and then you end up contacting the developers, and then you end up making the PR. But again, if it's curiosity driven, it's easier to make that contribution instead of just going out there and hunting, okay, uh, let me put something on my resume related to PyTorch, mm -hmm. maybe I should go to the GitHub. So may maybe that's not the best approach. Yeah, I, and I think um, one, one of the opportunities out there right now in the PyTorch world is the ecosystem. So while PyTorch is, by now, it's become uh, uh, a very elaborate project, even though it's approachable, uh, but there's a lot of it, uh, very good engineers working on it and so on. And there, there's a growing ecosystem that for sure has a few more hanging, low hanging fruit. Um, and maybe it's a bit easier to approach for a newcomer because it's uh, scoped, uh, scoped a bit more narrowly and, and so on. So I would suggest also to look into that. 
sure thing. Eli, did you have something to add? Uh, I was actually just going to mention the ecosystem as well. Um, I think that the PyTorch ecosystem, you know, in 2020 is in a really interesting place. You're starting to see a lot of interesting, uh, slightly higher level training frameworks. A lot of, um, uh, there's a, a project called Cornea that has a lot of image manipulation routines that are all uh, support back propagation so that you can do things and still train through those operations. Um, you know, it's PyTorch Lightning and Catalyst and uh, the work that Fast AI is doing. Like, there's a bunch of interesting things going on out there. And I think that, like Luca said, that's a great place to go ahead and, and get a toehold. For, for the audience, if, if you're interested to make a contribution to uh, Fast AI, I pretty much live on the forums. Please find me, contact me anytime. I'd be most happy to oh, yeah. work with, that too, with your sure. team. But uh, that, that brings me to a question from the AMA. This is by Akasnan, and uh, he talks about there's so many high-level APIs that are coming up for PyTorch, uh, Catalyst, Py, uh, PyTorch Lightning, just to mention two more. Uh, don't you think this would lead to fragmentation that happened with TensorFlow earlier? So I've actually been, been looking into this a little bit. And w one of the things that, that I've noticed that I'm really happy about is that a lot of these um, are focusing on removing the busy work while making it so that your actual model code remains agnostic. So you have this, you have this training loop that's going to do distributed training for you. It's going to do early stopping for you. It's going to log things to TensorBoard, but your actual model isn't going to be impacted by your choice of training loop. And that I think is, is really powerful because it means that if you decide, oh, I don't like the direction that this project is going or oh, I need this, this killer feature from some other thing, you just pick up your model. And I mean, I'm not going to say it's going to be zero work, but you just go over to the other one, you plop it in and you, you get running over there. Um, the other thing th that I've found is that of the... The, the, the ones that I've, I've looked into, and I'm not going to name names because I'm not going to try and make favorites out there, but due to the, the nature of how Pythonic PyTorch code is, getting into these training frameworks and reading their source code is, is really approachable. And so one of the things that, that when I'm adopting a tool like that, I like to do is I like to go and look through the source code and say, okay, if I need to, could I maintain this myself? You know, and I'm not saying that I could maintain it to the same level of, of innovation that the, the true maintainers own. But, you know, if they all get hit by a bus, am I going to be stuck with a pile of code that I can't interpret? Um, and I've been really pleased with, with how approachable these code bases are. So I think that there's, um, there's the possibility of fragmentation, but I think that, that, and this isn't globally true, but I think that in a lot of cases, they're, they're less, in, the frameworks are imposing less on their customers than might have been true previously. Yeah. Um, I, sorry, please. I think to, to add to Eli, uh, 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 I think one of the criteria I'd have for picking something there, I'm not using many of the higher level frameworks, but. Uh, and I don't know them that well, but one of the things I'd look at is, uh, uh, does it, is it kind of helping me do some things that I don't want to code up all the time, but I can still use PyTorch otherwise? Uh, or is it kind of getting between me and PyTorch? And I'd probably try to do something that doesn't distance me from PyTorch or, or that much because uh, uh, then uh, what Eli said, moving if you need to, or using something in PyTorch that the framework doesn't anticipate won't be possible. Uh, but if you have something that kind of strictly simplifies something that lets you do your modeling in PyTorch properly, uh, uh, that's probably, probably a good thing. And then the other thing is that there's kind of a balance to strike between having kind of a, a, a simple landscape of tools and having one tool for the job only uh, and kind of having something that can innovate independently. Um, and so uh, 
uh, kind of with the, we've seen this with uh, with uh, with deep learning frameworks themselves, where kind of uh, uh, PyTorch and TensorFlow now they have converged quite a bit um, on similar feature sets, at least in the kind of in the very 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 bird's eye view. Um, and then if you if you want uh, if you want to innovate, kind of you need someone to drive it and you could either drive it within projects or you could have several projects. So for example, uh, uh, frameworks like Jax kind of contribute something because they're just, they're not just fragmenting, but they're also contributing kind of a, a, a source of innovations. And I think that's similar for the higher level frameworks. Yeah, I think it's a it's a, a bit different from the fragmentation that we observed in uh, if, more in the TensorFlow one times, right? Where the yeah. the framework itself didn't help you, uh, you know, think in high level uh, too much, and so people started to 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 design abstractions on top of that. But the abstract the problem with those is that the abstract abstractions were often leaky. So, uh, you know, after uh, you, you, you did your part over there, then you had to go down and, and still, you know, for, for many tasks, uh, understand either because you had to, to parse the errors that came out and so on. There was still this reality down there coming up and, and hitting you somehow. Um, and things have changed since in, in TensorFlow land. Um, so, but what I see in in in, in the PyTorch ecosystem, like Lightning and Catalyst and so on, is that the approach is totally different. They don't try to mask uh, what what is PyTorch, but they are trying to make you do less or m more, like say, uh, not care about things that are important that can be implemented automatically, and you focus on, on the modeling side or something like, and so on, like Eli and, and Thomas have said. I think it's a pretty different place and it's a testimony to the design of PyTorch. I'd like to drop a plug. I've interviewed the creator of uh, Catalyst on the series. So audience, if you'd like to check that out, please uh, find the dis uh, link in the description of this podcast. Uh, another question by Akash is, and I think I, I, I'm not sure if this is covered in the book, but speaking of on the innovative side, uh, if someone wants to switch to PyTorch, especially if they are interested in edge uh, inferences, ML on edge devices, uh, what are your thoughts in that area? Inference, you mean like deployment on various devices, right? I, I believe so, yes. On uh, yes. So The question is on edge devices. I'm sure you cannot train yet on edge devices, probably just of an inference. Well, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so I think uh, uh, I, I think the story is kind of continually improving. Uh, so it was uh, a year and a quarter or so. It was in December 20, 2018 uh, uh, when I first tried and I got to a proof of concept of running PyTorch on Android. Um, and back then, uh, Facebook didn't really uh, have any interest in that. And so it uh, 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 there wasn't a huge investment, um, but then uh, uh, in the last summer, uh, uh, there was PyTorch Mobile, and then that came out. And so uh, uh, I think there, for example, for mobile deployments, uh, uh, people have and Facebook has invested quite a bit, and this has seen a lot of love. And uh, uh, now we have. Uh, unfortunately, it was too late for the book, but now we have PyTorch serving as the go-to uh, thing for serving. Um, and while uh, not everything is quite as optimized as we as we would like to have it, eventually, uh, I think it's it's getting there very quickly, and you can have very decent uh, uh, results also on all sorts of devices. So. Uh, I've worked quite a bit uh, uh, with PyTorch on the Raspberry, uh, uh, and that works reasonably well for inference. And of course, with the small GPU computers, 
uh, uh, you can also do uh, training if you want to, for example, if you want to do things like federated training, it, it might make sense to do things on the device more intensely. Uh, and that works very well too. And the beauty of it is that with PyTorch, I think, uh, uh, and, and I think that's something where PyTorch really shines too. Uh, you have kind of the end-to-end -end experience is really in PyTorch. Uh, so you don't really, you don't have to export your model and convert it to uh, uh, kind of a special mobile format or anything. Uh, but you can just uh, uh, let your model go through the JIT and then uh, uh, this PyTorch model, you can either reload in PyTorch itself and run it there, or you can uh, uh, run the same thing on mobile. And uh, I think that's that's something that makes it really easy because you can kind of switch back and forth and try something on your main device and then uh, uh, go to go back to the to the edge devices. And I, I think that's that's something that I really like about how PyTorch develops there. And uh, I think there's a lot of good things and a lot of performance improvements also uh, are coming over the next half year or so. Awesome. So uh, the, the next question is sort of a trick question. Uh, what are your thoughts on deep learning with TensorFlow, so to speak? That's not a book for the audience. I'm just talking about deep learning using TensorFlow generally. Yeah, if you can't download PyTorch, give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree. <laughs> no, I seriously. Say, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. More seriously, uh, 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 I think TensorFlow has a lot going for it, and uh, uh, obviously, it's a it's a large, well-supported uh, uh, framework, and people are doing great things with it, and uh, uh, and like it, and. Uh, uh, a great thing. Uh, uh, so I think uh, there's nothing wrong about using using TensorFlow, and we shouldn't. I mean, we like PyTorch for things that are good about PyTorch, but uh, uh, at the same time, there there are people that like TensorFlow for things that are good about TensorFlow, and that's perfectly cool. Uh, not everyone is the same, and not everyone wants the same thing. And so I think it's a it's a good thing. Sometimes it's annoying when you find something that's written for the other framework, but I'm sure that goes both ways, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I always suggest when they ask me uh, which framework or why PyTorch, I, I would say, you know, you should choose the, the framework that you, you, you stick to the framework that you know best. And I think uh, you, know, you, you need to be intimate with the framework because you don't have to see the framework. The framework has to disappear at some point, right? So, and I find that PyTorch is as a as an easier path towards that goal. So it disappears sooner. You know, you stop thinking about PyTorch and start thinking about what to do with it sooner. You, it's easier to 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 know uh, to have a good sense of what it does. And then, of course, to know it, there's a lot beneath, but it never pops up. So. Uh, so much. So, I think that that's the that's the advantage of PyTorch over other frameworks. But not knowing, for example, TensorFlow well in the TensorFlow two era, then I can't really speak for TensorFlow two. So, so uh, this this has been an insightful interview for me. Uh, I want to ask you one final question for people that are of a non-traditional uh, background that aren't from a math or a CS or a research background, uh, your suggestions to such people who are looking to get a break into machine learning? I think start with a project uh, uh, that's from your uh, domain of expertise. Uh, and then after you've read our book, of course, uh, <laughs> uh, you'll be all set. And, the, and maybe that's the other recommendation uh, uh, that Kind of is something that I think is very important is find kind of a community where you think you 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 fit in and you feel comfortable interacting with people. 
because uh, everyone will get stuck at some point. I know I certainly did and I certainly still do. Uh, uh, and so uh, uh, I always recommend the PyTorch forums to get help, uh, uh, but obviously other frameworks and other toolkits and other libraries ha also have great communities. Uh, Test AI has a very active community, as you know. Um, and so uh, and TensorFlow has a lot of mindshare. Well, I don't know whether they have a forum similar to PyTorch, uh, to the PyTorch one, I think, uh, and I don't think they have Shutter. <laughs> uh, Yaleki, <laughs> who's uh, yeah. the face of PyTorch on the PyTorch forums. Um, but uh, but so find something where you feel comfortable asking questions, uh, uh, and you also feel comfortable asking stupid questions because you will be get stuck and you will have to ask. And after you ask, you will say, yeah, I could have known that. But that happens to every one of us. I, I actually have a, a quote unquote dumb question that I asked just, uh, just a week ago. I was trying to figure out why I couldn't get um, decent scaling on multi-GPU training. So I'm asking on the PyTorch forums, and I'm going on to this. It turns out that the, the home machine that I've got with two GPUs the airflow is bad. And I was having thermal <laughs> throttling when they were both running. <laughs> it's just like basic physics. And yet I'm like, why, why can't I get good scaling? It's so bad. <laughs> um, to, go, to go back to the original question, one of the things I also wanted to add is that um, uh, I do think that for people coming in from, from you know, outside of the traditional background, and I do not say this in order to disaid anyone at all, but do recognize that, you know, CS programs and math backgrounds and all of those kinds of things are so common in this field for a reason. Someone coming in without those, those I'm going to call them advantages, recognize that you're going to be lacking in, in those advantages. And as you are working to, towards proficiency, be very cognizant of where your gaps are and, and proactively work to, to fill those gaps in ways so that they're not holding you back. Um, and if that means, you know, shifting your focus in certain ways to, to focus more on your strengths, like Tom said, pick a project that's already in your area of expertise. So you're not having to learn domain knowledge at the same time as having to learn, uh, you know, API knowledge and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and, and, and use that time savings to then kind of catch up on the other parts that you're going to need. Um, and so I think that, that, you know, being honest with yourself in terms of like knowing what you need to work on and knowing what you've got down cold is, is really going to be helpful as, as, as you make those kinds of transitions. Yeah. What I would say is that coming from other domains is a great strength. Um, you know, uh, having a, a, a domain question is something that it's really hard to have if you have a purely computer science background, because then you have to learn how to what questions you might want to ask when you get into something, and it takes a lot of time and effort to to be able to formulate the right questions or interesting questions. So I think there's a great opportunity to fill the gaps, as Eli was saying. Uh, coming from a, an ex, a different background and have all this baggage of experience and questions and curiosity that it's re really, you know, this soft thing that it's hard to acquire if not, you know, being, having been immersed in a, different, um, in a different setting before. So I think there's a great opportunity, great for chemistry, you know, take this and take that put them together and, uh, and see what happens. So it's, it's really precious. Yeah, and maybe to add to that, uh, kind of teaming up with someone, maybe even someone who yeah. helps you bridge the gaps can be hugely beneficial. And uh, also teaming up with someone probably is universally a good idea. Uh, uh, when you endeavor new projects in particular, if it's going to be longer ones. Uh, I mean, if it, if teaming up helps writing a book, 
that teaming up helps with almost anything. Yeah, teaming up, team up with someone. And when you think you don't, you will never make it, look for a third one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Kaggle is the easiest uh, platform to team up. Uh, also, people think of how should I get a break into machine learning. Uh, maybe the reason you got excited about it in the first place is because you'd like to apply it to your field. And this is one of those rare fields where you don't have to start from a junior role all and work your way up again. Bring machine learning to your field, already leverage your knowledge, see, and uh, go from there. Many people miss out on the fact that it doesn't have to always start from scratch in that sense. Yeah, that's an excellent so, point, yeah. yeah. Now, uh, before we end the call, uh, I'll definitely have your LinkedIn websites and Twitter handles. Uh, any other platforms where we can follow you and follow your work? Uh, any platforms you'd want to mention? Yeah, I, I have a black apps. sheep. Oh, sorry, Eli. You no, go, go ahead, on. go ahead. No, no, you go. I, I was just going to say that I, I have an absolutely dire social media presence. It is, it is a barren wasteland, so... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe our audience can help change that if you want. <laughs> Sounds good. Yes, um, so I have a silly little blog uh, at uh, learnapparat.de. Uh, and yeah, recently I've posted too much about epidemiology because I needed to understand that for my own well being. Uh, but uh, uh, usually I try to blog about cool kernels or things you can do with PyTorch and uh, stuff like that. Awesome. Yeah, I have a very low uh, volume Twitter feed. Uh, so I'll, I like to tweet from time to time. Elon Tiga is my handle. And then, and then I'm on a bit on GitHub. I contribute to uh, Redis AI and Hangar with Tensorberg and a few other things. So, yeah, that, those are my social things. Awesome. Uh, again, audience, please find that in the description of this podcast. Um, Eli, Luca, and Thomas, thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for Thank you. It's been great. Thing. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you for having us on. Sam, thank you. And uh... thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give it a review or feel free to shoot me a message. You can find all of the social media links in the description. If you like the show, please subscribe and tune in each week to Chai Time Data Science.